Welcome, everybody. Uh, Nick, should, do you think we should get started, or would you like to wait a couple minutes? What's what works for you? Uh, I think we can get started. All right. I think we've got a critical mass here. Yeah, I think we'll have more people coming in. First of all, I want to thank all of you who are here today for joining us. Um, and on behalf of Campus Compact, I welcome you to this session um, with Nick Longo, where he's going to talk about a new publication with Campus Compact and AAC and you called Practicing Democracy, a Toolkit for Educating Civic Professionals. Um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to introduce Nick and to have had the privilege to work with him as the publications lead at Campus Compact um, to translate his thoughts and writings into what you'll see as a beautiful publication uh, that you'll hear more about today. Uh, Nick is to me the, the consummate scholar practitioner. Besides being an excellent writer, outstanding thinker, He's also a very respected teacher, and that's evidence in him being the recipient of the 2022 Innovation in Teaching Excellence Award at Providence College. For those of you who don't know Nick, he is a professor of global studies and chair of the department at Providence College. He also co-directs the Dialogue, Inclusion, and Democracy, or DID Lab, at Providence College. And he's a board member and faculty mentor for College Unbound, an innovative degree granting college for adult learners in Providence. Nick's coursework at Providence College is interdisciplinary in nature and really is intended to create spaces for students to bridge differences and engage in real world problem solving. Uh, under his leadership, the DID Lab is going to be launching or has launched, you can talk more about that perhaps, a civic discourse project at Providence College with the support of the uh, Arthur Vining Davis Foundation uh, that will build upon deliberative practices for addressing uh, disputed questions to create an inclusive dialogue in the curriculum and student life and in the local community. Uh, while Nick's list of publications is way too numerous for me to mention individually, I will say that Nick has and continues to undertake publicly engaged scholarly projects on civic education and place-based community building. Uh, most recently with the support from the Kettering Foundation, TIA Crep Institute, and the National, National Endowment for the Arts. The resources and ideas he will present today build on conversations and collegial exchanges he's had the opportunity to be involved in over the years, particularly through an ongoing research exchange convened by the Kettering Foundation that began back in 2018. I know Campus, Com Com Campus Compact, along with our colleagues at, colleagues at AAC and you, feel extremely fortunate to have had this opportunity to work with Nick to co-publish this new online book. So thank you, Nick, for your partnership, and we really look forward to hearing more about you, your work, and the resource in our session today. So I'm going to hand it over to Nick. Oh, thank you so much, Clayton. And thank you for that it's just really beautiful, kind introduction. It's been such a pleasure to work with you and Campus Compact, and which has really been a full circle mo uh, movement for me because I started my career, my first job while I was actually still a graduate student was with National Campus Compact with the Raise Your Voice campaign. Some of my first publications were with Campus Compact in the early 2000s. And now to be able to publish this and, and work and collaborate with you all has been a pleasure. And it's just a great opportunity to do a really, I hope, important work. And the thing that I'm really proud of with this publication is that it's a free online resource. Because I think we, if we think about democratizing our processes, we have to think about making our resources accessible. Um, I, will, I will say, so this publication was a collaborative venture with Campus Compact and ACNU have published it. But it started in 2018 with a, a learning exchange with the Kettering Foundation. And the Kettering Foundation was bringing together a group of folks. And there was, there's a lot of research around this idea of civic professionals. You know, Albert Zerg talks, talks about democratic professionals or Harry Boyd talks about citizen professionals. But we felt like there was not enough, really a sense of how, what is the pedagogy of civic professionalism? How do you educate a new generation to be civic professionals? If we had a little bit of an idea of what the end goal might be, we didn't necessarily know how we could embed that work into our educational settings. So this was a project that I took on in conversation with a, a learning exchange group from the Kettering Foundation. And then I, what I would do is I kind of put it into practice. And I said, like, how can I build this into my teaching? And that was done in two different, really diverse locations. So I'm a full-time faculty at Providence College. So with my my students at Providence College, which is a predominantly white institution, 18 to 22 year olds. And then also I'm on the board and a kind of faculty mentor at College Unbound, which is a Hispanic serving institution working with adults. So I was able to experiment with these ideas of educating for kind of 
democratic practice uh, in with College Unbound and Campus Compact and in and, and Providence College, and the result has been this publication. So this 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 work comes out of kind of a a sense of like what's at stake, a crisis of democracy. And I'm going to give kind of a maybe a 15, 20 minute overview. And then we're going to have a chance for conversation and, and questions. But what's at stake is, and more and more we see this language of a crisis of democracy. And the way I've come to understand this crisis of democracy, specifically for the kind of citizen-centered democracy that a lot of folks, I think, on this, on this call are, are interested in promoting, is that we're seeing three major challenges. And the first is this loss of trust. And almost any survey you look at, you see the loss of trust of major institutions, you know, everything from government to the Supreme Court, even the military and higher education, more and more is seen as not a trustworthy institution. Part of what my research has shown is that that loss of trust is a two-way street. Part of the reason that folks are untrusting of institutions is that institutions have citizens on the sidelines. They're not involving them in a real process of decision-making. And because of that, we see a loss of trust going both ways. And that's that's a part of the crisis of democracy. Kind of the second piece of this crisis is I did a series of interviews with Tuba Agerton and uh, Eric Sung at Providence College. And this, this photo is actually one of Eric Sung's photos from the exhibition that he put together, Portales, connected to that. And we did these interviews with folks and mostly artists and had their experience with COVID. And what we found was widespread isolation and kind of the tearing of the fabric and of community was just magnified with COVID and uh, the sense of isolation. And at the same time, we're seeing isolation and polarization. More and more people are into their own camps. We, if you look at something like the Harry survey, if you think about how this has an impact on higher education, we're seeing the most polarized group of young people coming to higher education. So there are fewer social connections and folks don't know how to talk across differences. So that's the second piece, it's a crisis of, of democracy. And the third is a, this idea of what folks call wicked problems. You know, wicked problems are adaptive challenges that don't have easy solutions. There's no technical way that we can solve climate change or um, anti-racism or educational inequity. So we have this a series of wicked problems and more and more democracy itself is a wicked problem. And uh, the challenges facing democracy are a wicked problem. So given this like, kind of loss of trust, isolation and polarization, this sense of wicked problems, I, I, I was interested in kind of what I could do about it. And one of the things I found is like this idea of developing civic prompts. And if you think about Parker Palmer has this beautiful idea of, you know, do you have a kind of all of us to ask ourselves in, in our sense of vocation, do you have a well-grounded personal experience and conviction concerning whatever it is you're trying to teach? And for me, I had an experience as a, as a graduate student early in my career, where I was part of a project called the Jane Addams School in St. Paul, Minnesota, that was inspired by the Settlement House tradition and uh, the Highlander Folk School. And what Jane Addams School was trying to do was to bring people together across differences, college students, neighborhood residents, immigrants, and create a learning community where everyone's a teacher and everyone's a learner. And the framework for that work was really democratic practice and public work. You know, I hadn't been introduced as an undergraduate to, to service learning, but this was my first introduction to a really a more democratic framing and practice for the work. From Jane Addams School, I went, and I, as I mentioned, I went and worked with Campus Compact and was directing a national uh, civic engagement initiative. And that gave me a chance to visit with college students all around the country. I've visited dozens of campuses. And as I talked to college students, the thing that I realized and I came away with was that Young people don't aren't going to learn about democracy some, from something that's taught in a classroom, you know, in political science. What they're learning about and how they ex, is how they experience democracy in their everyday lives, and that's how they come to shape their understandings of democracy. So, with that, with the way I kind of came out of that is that you know I wanted to make a difference in this larger effort around making democracy work as it should. And for me, the place to really think about an intervention was in education. I was introduced to the Highlander Folk School, and I, as I mentioned, and uh, Miles Horton, the founder of the Highlander Folk School, has this idea that he says the best way of educating people is to give them an experience that embodies what you're trying to teach. So when you believe in a democratic society, you provide a setting for education that's democratic. 
in some ways it's the simplest idea in the world, but I think it's really powerful and profound. And it's not something that a lot of, a lot of our young people have experiences with. So this, this, uh, this toolkit is really an attempt to create spaces for democracy in our educational settings. So why college and universities? Why is it important to do this work in colleges and universities? Kind of what's at stake? The first challenge we have in, in colleges and universities is kind of the, the prevalence of the neoliberal market-driven, highly privatized university where more and more you know, decisions are getting made as, as any other business might get made. Uh, it's kind of a consumer culture we see in higher education. A second issue is, is we're seeing the culture wars coming to higher education. I mean, they're, they're pronounced in all aspects of our society in, in education, the teaching of things like critical race theory. And now more and more we're seeing the culture wars come to higher education and with you know, legislators trying to dictate and, and kind of um, um, curriculum and decisions that are made on college campuses. So this is a polarized environment that is now becoming more and more higher education is a site for part of that polarization. And finally, you know, I had mentioned these wicked problems earlier, is there's an idea, and I think this is an ethos and a belief in folks that are connected with Campus Compact, is that higher education has a responsibility to the public good. We were founded on that mission and that we need campuses to more respectfully respond to public problems. And I always think back to this, um, this idea, this question that Ira Harkavy from the University of Pennsylvania posed. And he says, how do we have the problems we have in society if we have such great universities? And I think it's our university's responsibility to respond to, to the challenges that are facing our society. This isn't an easy time to do that. We both have a time of kind of polarization, as I mentioned, but then also alternative facts. And you could see this, um, this uh, cartoon on the side. It says, I'm sorry, Ginny, your answer was correct, but Kevin shouted his incorrect answer over yours, so he gets the points. So we're living in a time of alternative facts where higher education needs to be the arbiter of this and needs to be a, a space where we think about, okay, facts do matter. At the same time in higher education, and we see this at the most recently at Stanford University, where there's controversies over free speech and hate speech and academic freedom. And these are kind of the sites in the world that we live in and we have to be ready to respond to those controversies. So how can uh, we each, uh, can we educate civic professionals ready to tackle wicked problems? So if that's our framing question, we have to think about maybe we need to reimagine education in at least three different ways. And the first is that to think about education being more deliberative. And this is engaging, like how can education be a space to engage in those kinds of constructive conversations across difference? Um, the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation put together this really nice uh, visual of the different ways that you could imagine and you see people engaging in, in civil discourse around exploration of ideas and sharing stories, conflict transformation, uh, kind of civil discourse and dialogue as a way to deliberate, to make decisions, and as a way to move towards co you know, collective action. And the Beverly Tatum kind of sums up this idea of, you know, including deliberative practices in education and says, you, you know, you can't solve a problem if you can't talk about it. So we need our education to be spaces where we can learn to deliberate and talk to each other. Kind of a second idea is that education needs to be built on the assets and the talents and the skills of non-professionals and everyone in the ecology of education. This is uh, this photo here on the left is comes from a classroom I was observing at the University of Cape Town. And uh, this was Janice McMillan was offering a, a session with a group of engineering students and it was on knowledge. And there's a group of hundred students. And she said, can, can someone come up and translate knowledge into another language? And there were like 20 different languages just in that room. And people came up and translated the, the word knowledge into their different languages. And for me, this photo embodies that idea that we have so many untapped assets and potential in our communities, in our classrooms. And part of the way we have to think about education is thinking about how we make change from the inside out, as John, John McKnight talks about uh, with his work with the Asset-Based Community Development Institute. And finally, education needs to be collaborative. Uh, Bar and Tag talked over, just over two dozen years ago now about a kind of shifting paradigm from an institutional to a learning paradigm. And I think we're now in a, kind of the emergence of a new collaborative paradigm where we really think about co-creating knowledge and public products. 
Uh, we're doing this at Providence College with our, our, democracy, our Dialogue Inclusion and Democracy Lab, the DID Lab, where we are bringing students and community members together to think about how we can use public spaces to co-create knowledge. And John Saltmarsh talked about this in an interview I did with him. He said, you know, in an ideal class, you start the process. So you start the process around collaboration by asking together, what do we need to know? So think about that. How do we together, what do we need to know to solve public problems? You know, what are the assets we have in the room? And then how do we collaborate? And a community organizer introduced me to this idea uh, a number of years ago, which has kind of stayed with me. And this idea that one plus one is greater than two. So by collaborating, we're creating new social capital and new connections. So who are civic professionals? Civic professionals are folks who have a public identity. So it's about who they are and the way they see themselves in their work. And then they have a deliberative way of acting that enables them to share power, work collaboratively and engage to address wicked problems. So these are folks that are deliberative, the kind of education we wanna see, asset-based and collaborative. So the work of civic professionals is the work that involves, you know, it, it involves citizens and the folks who are stakeholders earlier in the process to think about how to name an issue and then to frame potential responses. And then it also uh, citizen professionals, civic professionals engage with a broad range of stakeholders interacting with each other. So it's not just the kind of individuals giving input. And it's also not just the usual suspects or those who have power. So what this is about is really educating civic, civic professionals is about democratizing professionals and not professionalizing citizenship. And I think this is an important distinction. You know, we, what we're not trying to do is create professional citizens. We're trying to reimagine what it means to be a professional in society so that those professionals are in, able to engage with the public in meaningful ways to be able to solve problems. Here's a, this, is, this is, comes from the toolkit. And so these are some of the habits and skills of civic professionals. So folks who work reflectively and a set of skills like listening eloquently, engaging in critical reflection. And you could read these uh, on the screen. Those are folks who are working publicly, who are working inclusively and are working collaboratively. So um, civic professionals aim to you know, really think about how they listen to local knowledge, share tasks, you know, catalyze public participation among a diverse group of community members, facilitate constructive conversations. Uh, there's a sense of inclusion and broad belonging that they bring to their work. They recognize community assets, empower marginalized and underrepresented voices, and they improvise with creative and mutual responses, and they learn as much as they teach, and ultimately they're there to serve the public. So what I, what I also wanna kind of just say, you know, this is a complex idea. And this is uh, a, another cartoon from, from the New Yorker, where it says, these smug pilots have lost touch with regular passengers like us. Who thinks I should fly the plane? And I love this because this is the contrast between how we think about expertise. There are settings where we need expertise. You know, flying a plane is a great example. We need expertise in almost to solve just about any problem, but it's just about what kind of expertise. And it's really about flipping expertise to think about how we can think about experts on tap, not experts on top. This is a, a nice chart put together by Harry Point where he differentiates between citizen professionals and outside experts. This is also in the toolkit and as part of the, the learning curriculum. He talks about the difference between, you know, thinking about your work as altruistic service, where you're an expert, you go in to fix problems, you know, with an expert intervention, and you're a service provider, versus this idea of a civic professional or citizen professional who's co-creating knowledge, who's where professionals and amateurs are working together to do public work, and really to see their work as facilitators and catalysts. So this is kind of a background framing. And now I just wanna talk about some of the really like specifics of what this toolkit is and how you might use it. Uh, here's the table of contents. So this is, there's 12 different lesson plans and then also an assessment rubric. And then there's a set of uh, recommended readings. This very much, I think we see this as a living document. This is something that we want you to use, to add on to to be able to think about what other lessons can we create and add to this around these themes of you know, shaping culture, developing concepts, building skills, and then putting it into practice. Um, to kind of get even more in the weeds on this, 
there's um, the, the kind of the first, and I'll just use, I'm just going to go in detail on this first one. But the first kind of lesson is around this idea of shaping culture. And lesson one is something that we all do in our practice is developing a community learning agreement. You know, you might do this in your first class, your first meeting with a community group where you want to develop a kind of a, an ethos of a way that you're going to work together. Uh, each of the uh, lesson plans has a, kind of a similar format. So each of the 12 lessons has this format where it has the kind of overall uh, theme, which in this theme is shaping culture. Next, the, all of the lesson plans have a learning objectives. So this lesson learning objectives is to develop a community agreement for joint learning among a group and then uh, learn from stories about personal educational experiences. There's then an overview for all the lesson plans. So here, this one is kind of saying like, here's a kind of a, just, just a short framing about how you, why it's important to develop these mutually agreed upon ground rules to make it a co-creative process and to have an inclusive process to do this. Each of the 12 lesson plans are set up to be 75 minutes. That's just a, an example, but you can easily kind of make these your own and they could be used in a shorter session or they can be used for a longer period of time where you, you know, spend more time on the reading or more time doing some of the exercises, adding to some of the civic prompts. Each of the lessons then has a sense of like a lesson preparation. So this is kind of some of the background work that the facilitator would do. So in this, this lesson is using a, a method called World Cafe. It introduces you to World Cafe that as a process of hosting dialogues. Um, and then uh, you will get the kind of detailed, like here's a suggestion of how you might do this. So you might spend 15 minutes on an introduction and introducing uh, the ideas of why it's important to develop a community learning agreement. And here's some of the best practices from someone like Adrian Marie Brown in Emergent Strategies. And then you could see kind of go into detail the next, you know, doing World Cafe style, working in small groups, second round of small groups with a second set of questions, another round with different small groups, and then you do some large group harvesting. This is just one example of kind of how the, the lessons are set up in, in the guide. Just to give you a sense, I'm, I'm not going to go into as detail, but to the rest of the guide, the next section is around developing concepts. And uh, this is kind of around some of the conceptual work around how students might see themselves as and develop their ideas of what it means to be a civic professional. Um, this first one is using something called Chalk Talk as a way to, to develop the concept of civic professionalism. Uh, a next one is using a whole series of vignettes and case studies around thinking about what it means to be a, a civic professional. Um, uh, the fourth lesson is uses that earlier chart around habits and skills of civic professionals and then it invites students to kind of use some of that uh, initial work to develop their own ideas about what habits and skills are important. And then also to begin to assess themselves of what their habits and skills are and which ones they want to develop over the course of your sustained work together. And then this final one in this section is about connecting careers and the common good. Uh, I think this is a common kind of tension point sometimes for thinking about is college to get a job or is college to do good in society? And it, it could be both. And this is an activity that asks students to kind of think about the kind of work they want to do together with a, a ranking activity where they do self-reflection and then they do group reflection to think about, okay, how, you know, what is my vocational calling and how, how might the next stage of my work be an opportunity to build some of the skills to make the kind of difference I want while also, you know, getting the kind of job and career opportunities that, that are important to me. The next section is around building skills. And there's a set of skills that, that we think are just essential for being a civic professional. These are really essential skills for democratic citizenship. And the first one is around facilitation where the, the guide has a whole activity around something called the neutrality challenge which was uh, kind of built on something that my colleague Tim Schaefer developed with Martine Karkakson and uh, Nancy Thomas. And uh, it's a way to think about how you might imagine yourself as a facilitator, kind of what's your core values, but then also how in different kinds of contexts you might need to bring different tools to facilitation, when it's important to be neutral and when it's important to lean in on, on certain questions as a facilitator. A next uh, section on building skills is around public narrative. 
Public narrative is, a, is an idea and a practice for community organizing developed by Marshall Gans at Harvard. This is a lesson plan to help students develop that skill, really building on, on his skill, his exercises and his conceptualization of public narrative. Uh, next is a skill around asset-based community development. This is something developed by um, you know, John McKnight, Jody Kretzman, and others around the Asset-Based Community Development Institute in Chicago. And this is a kind of a way to help students begin to think about the glass as half full rather than half empty, but then at the same time have some really practical ways to learn about the assets in the classroom and in the community. Next is a skill uh, called one-to-ones, which is kind of a core relationship building skill of community organizing developed by the Industrial Areas Foundation. This is something that I've been using in my community organizing classes for many years, and I, I couldn't find any uh, curriculum around how to do this. So this, is, this was putting together some of the ways I've used it in class in, in one place, and would love to see how people might add to this. And uh, one-to-ones are kind of a way to be able to build relationships with folks, find mutual self-interest, and then begin to build a power base for action. And then finally, the last skill is around uh, kind of naming and framing and asking strategic questions, which is a set of skills that comes out of the work of the Kettering Foundation and a whole bunch of uh, organizations that promote dialogue and deliberation. And it's kind of has a set of activities and ways to help students develop those skills in uh, naming, framing, and then asking strategic questions for for um, you know, for both dialogue purposes and for deliberation to be able to make decisions. So this next section is the last kind of practical section is about putting it into practice. And the, this section has a, a series of community vignettes. So this is what kind of like case scenarios, things that have happened in community settings that students might interact uh, and might engage with and be able to think about how they might respond to it. Uh, so there's a set of community vignettes that we've developed and then ask students, how would you respond to them? There's a set of campus vignettes. The campus vignettes were inspired by the Bipartisan Policy Institute who put together a series of this in a really helpful guide that they had. And then finally, there's a set of facilitation vignettes that were inspired by some work that was put together by Tufts University. So these are sets of vignettes that you can use right in your classroom with students to help them think about kind of their work in community, their work in organizing on campus, and their work as facilitators. And there's also the opportunity and really an invitation to write your own vignettes. These are just some examples of it, but this, these were kind of grist to get you started. And then the final section is a, is a case study. And this is a case study on youth advocacy and public policy that's inspired by some organizing work that happened in Providence with the Providence Student Union and around transportation policy. It's one case study, but again, it kind of invites you to add to it or to write your own case study or find other case studies that might be useful. The final section of the book uh, is this uh, assessment rubric for democratic skills. Uh, and what I tried to do was really think about assessment differently. So instead of assessment being something where you kind of shift from being a novice to someone who has mastery, to really think about assessment as something that's a democratic process that all any of us and all of us can be involved with. So there's a set of criteria like, you know, that kind of skills and habits for um, being a civic professional, like sharing public narratives or listening eloquently or naming and framing community issues. And then which each of these kind of habits or skills, there's a set of questions that students can ask and be constantly being going back to. And then a sense of like what mastery in that area might look for, might look like. So the idea with this is that this rubric is something that uh, you might use at multiple times during the semester and allow people to think about and see their own growth over, over time. And, but it's really meant to be developmental. And then here's the last uh, kind of part of that, engaging in public work and then reflecting on community practice. So kind of this, this is my last slide. And this is, so as I mentioned in the very beginning that this is, this guide was something that was engaged through practice. It was engaged mostly with students from Providence College and College Unbound, but then other networks that, I, that I've been part of, including Campus Compact and AACNU. Um, the thing that really I wanted to, to point out is that the lessons are designed to provide a pathway to civic learning for all students in all majors. 
So often we think about, oh, you know, civic is something that can happen in political science or maybe sociology or certain disciplines. Uh, but I think the this framing is helpful because it, it's saying that regardless of your fields, whether you're in business or you're a future scientist, we can think about the civic dimension of your work. And the way that some students thought about this was just really beautiful. And I just want to end with these two quotes. Uh, one was from a global studies student at Providence College who said, if we're looking to create community based on equity and justice. We need to imagine new systems. A lack of imagination will stifle this process. Developing a capacity to draw on different strengths will be the way to empower individuals to ensure collective action. We will not make headway against the tide unless we row together. Instead of being detached experts who talk at people, we need to find creative ways to inspire dialogue. And this student in College Unbound who was, uh, you know, really well-established person in the community, uh, longtime resident, said professional experts would come in, research and study our community and come back with solutions they felt were the best solutions. Their conclusions, the ideas were framed by a look into our community from the outside. They would talk to us, about us, but without us. It was never felt true to the feeling that what was really going on because there was never a connection to the professional coming in from the outside. It just felt fake. So kind of a call to thinking differently about uh, what it might mean to be a civic professional from, from two students who've been engaged with this material. So I wanna stop there and uh, thank you all for being, being here. I think we're gonna now open this up for conversation, for questions and an opportunity to uh, to engage collectively with, uh, with some of the issues that got raised.